I mean, there's a history of voter intimidation and voter discrimination and obstacles to the ballot, especially in African-American and Latino communities. And so you've got to view the guy showing up in, you know, the camo gear and masks as part of that history. This is an attempt to discourage people from going out to vote. And it's really critical in this election that every voter understand all of the different ways they can vote in their state and that they do vote and they show no fear. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge the point that you said, that political violence can come from all different uh, parts of the political spectrum, yeah. while also really having to acknowledge a very central fact that reporting from the FBI and from and even in terms of Homeland Security, uh, Jamie and I sit and we he is the chair and I'm the vice chair of the House Oversight Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. And we've held hearings on this and the there is absolutely no doubt that the data shows yeah. that the vast majority of, of incidents of domestic terror come from white nationalism and that we are really truly facing an environment of fascism and in the United States of America, this type of intimidation at the polls brings us to Jim Crow. It brings us back and, and harkens back to a very unique form of American apartheid that is not that long past ago. And we have never fully healed from it. And those wounds threaten to rip right back open if we do not strongly defend democracy in the United States of America. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the plaintiffs in that lawsuit cite the, night, the 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act, uh, which, of course, is passed precisely because of voter intimidation, precisely of this type. Now, the judge in that ruling, very sort of fascinatingly, who, who knocks down it, says it's fine, says, well, there's no example of they're targeting black or Latino minority voters here, which is true. But it's also like, I don't know if like equal opportunity ballot intimidation <laughs> passes constitutional muster where right. a specified ballot intimidation doesn't, which seems to be sort of the ruling here. Yeah. But it's also like, it just feels there's a level of, uh, that we've walked off some mm -hmm. platform of liberal democracy, free and open debate into this kind of menace and berserk. And I guess the question is, like, how do you think about getting back onto the platform? Mm. Like, what, how do you wrench that back in a society that d has taken some real steps towards something other? Well, I mean, what are the big political tectonic plates here? Um, you know, there's the central rhetoric on the right beyond big lie and election denialism is replacement theory, which reflects the anxiety that America sometime later on in this century um, will be a society where whites are the biggest racial bloc and yet are not a majority in the country. And they're playing on that fear. And so all of the electoral paranoia is really about the fact that um, the white bloc vote is not going to be able to win elections yeah. mm -hmm. whenever deliberate white blocs form. Um, and the way to address that um, is through the recognition that the vast majority of Americans have already accepted the fact that we are the world's greatest multiracial, yeah. multi-ethnic, multi-religious constitutional democracy, and we know how to live together, and that's what makes America great. Yeah. That's what makes us truly exceptional. And I think, I think the other thing, and I've, I've watched Democrats struggle, I think, to find this message, and, and some do it better than others, is you know, this question of weaving together this coalition of sort of solidarity across these lines of difference, which is that, like, it doesn't have to be zero sum. Like, mm -hmm. I get the piece of pie, so you don't, right? Um, and I think that's particularly relevant, it seems to me, in the case of this, these midterms, right? Because at one level, it's like, it feels existential from the level of democracy, and I think it is in some ways. But it's also like, I was just talking to someone who works on a political campaign who was talking about being in NYCHA houses, which is mm -hmm. the public housing here, and it's like, he's talking to people that can't feed their kids, mm -hmm. right? That's what's front of mind for them. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question to you is, like, how, how do you message around this stuff in an environment where people are focused on real, important, material, immediate concerns, and also those concerns are being used to kind of pry people in such a way that they tip the scales towards this political party that increasingly doesn't believe in democracy? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think what's really important and the way that we message about this is talking about the racial realities of our economic issues and the economic realities of racial issues, hmm. that these are things are not 
uh, are not distinct or siloed. If you are a black American, if you are black or Latino, in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you were disproportionately targeted for unjust incarceration. Then once that happened, particularly centered on the war on drugs, mm -hmm. then once you have that on your record, you cannot access housing in the same way. You cannot get employed in the same way. You, you have all these structural barriers that really funnel you into being trapped in poverty. Uh, when it talks about inflation, when we talk about redline, when we talk about who can get a mortgage and who can't, right. how it's 10 times harder to be poor in America or to be working class in America and that and how that divide is growing. All of these things are very interconnected and they want us to think that they're very separate, that it's either or. And even when we talk about issues like inflation, a lot of this has to do with the massive consolidation of our markets and corporate greed. Our inflation is not going up due to government policies. Inflation is going up due to Wall Street decisions. And the idea that they can just squeeze us for every penny that we're worth. And we can also say that and acknowledge the fact that that's impacting some communities more than others. And that, I think, is how we can really emphasize this message. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it's just really important to, again, center this fact that this idea that it's either or is very dangerous. And the idea that emphasizing social equity is somehow a detriment to our democracy is playing into the hands of the folks that don't want us to talk about either. Look, we need a functioning democracy in order to deliver the economic goods to the people. Um, I'm proud of the fact that it's our party. I don't know if people that, believe that, though. Well, but it's true. <laughs> like, I, I think, think that I honestly the, think that people's belief in that as a first principle. I'll give you a great opinion. example of it. I'll give you two great examples of it. OK, one, um, we just dramatically lowered prescription drug costs, out-of-pocket prescription drug costs for millions of Americans in the Medicare program by saying that you're, that you're limited to $2,000 to what you're going to have to pay in a year. And if you're a diabetic on insulin shots to $35 a month, that's going to save a lot of my constituents thousands and thousands of dollars a year. And we were able to save billions of dollars while we did it. How did we do that? Well, we repealed a GOP special interest provision that Billy Towson, as chair of the Energy and Commerce, had slipped in, which said the government in the Medicare program cannot negotiate with Big Pharma for lower drug prices. In other words, it was corporate socialism yeah. where they got to dictate to the government and to the people what the prices would be. We just finally, after 10 years of struggle, overturned that, and we got Republicans campaigning all over America to repeal what we just did in order to save billions of dollars and to lower everybody's prescription drug costs. It's the same thing with infrastructure. You know, I sat there for four years under Donald Trump. They had an infrastructure day. They had an infrastructure week. They had an infrastructure month. They just didn't have an infrastructure bill, you know. And we got the bill done in President Biden's first year in office. So that's a $1.2 trillion investment in the roads and the highways and the bridges and the ports and the airports and expanding broadband access in rural areas. Um, we did that. We didn't just talk about it. We delivered. And so, look, does anybody think that um, the, it's the autocrats of the world, like Vladimir Putin or the kleptocrats like Donald Trump, who are going to deliver to the middle class? And they get in, and what they do immediately right. is they cut taxes for the wealthiest people That's in society. Right. That's their agenda. And they do it every single time. And you can look at it historically. The middle class in America prospers when Democrats are in control, not Republicans. It's pretty wild. They have, I mean, they definitely have been... They haven't sort of led with this, but increasingly the last few weeks, you've heard Republicans starting to talk about if they win the House, mm -hmm. what they'll do. And it's like, hold the debt ceiling hostage, cut social spending, maybe cut Medicare and Social Security if we can, and make the tax cuts permanent is like the guiding North Star. Like when, when everything is wiped away in the end, that's in the dollars and cents um, sense, that's what they're going to do. Yeah. And... They want to criminalize abortion at 15 weeks nationally. Kevin McCarthy, the House, major the House Minority Leader, who wants to become Speaker, um, has come out in favor of criminalizing abortion at 15 weeks. Are they going to pay for all those babies? Exactly. And, yeah. and they no, they won't. No, they won't. And they want to ensure that—and and not only did they say that they want to cut 
programs like Medicare, but that they want to, and Social Security, but that they want to hold the entire United States economy hostage by threatening to not raise the debt limit in order to force President Biden to cut Medicare. And so we want to talk about class issues. You will, I mean, this will be so destructive for all of old, all our older adults in this country. Um, the, the one thing I'll say as a final point is that we'll, we'll have you back on the show after the election. Uh, we'll see what happens. But, but if they We're do- We're gonna win, by the way. Well, yes, I, I would, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> That, that prediction is worth what he's charging you for it, just for the record. But we will have you, uh, we, we, will, we will have you back afterwards and, and talk about how to deal with the debt ceiling issue if that uh, comes to that. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, Congressman Jamie Raskin, uh, it's, it's so wonderful to have you both here. I really do appreciate it. Thank you very of much. Thanks, Thanks for having me.